Shabbat Shalom, my friends. Yes, I scanned the heavens and checked the moon on Wednesday evening. The moon then was almost full. That means two very important things. The first is that Tu Ba'av, the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Av, began on sundown Thursday, July 26th, and last through Friday evening, July 27th. Tu Ba'av is known as the Jewish Valentine's Day. It is a day of love that is actually mentioned some, well, more than 2,000 years ago in the Mishnah. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel taught, there are no happier days for the children of Israel than the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. Since on these days, the daughters of Jerusalem got dressed in white and danced in the vineyards. And what were these young women saying? Young men, consider whom you would choose to be your wife. Mishnah Tanit, chapter 4. So, both the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur <clears throat> excuse me, were days of love when a great deal of heavy-duty matchmaking went on. I can only guess that some people's thoughts on Yom Kippur were not totally devoted to chet and tshuva, to sin and repentance. So let's just remember that this particular weekend is dedicated to love. <clears throat> so that's the first thing taught to us by the current full moon. The second thing is that it's now only one and a half months to Rosh Hashanah. Wow. Rabbis everywhere are scrambling to write their sermons, and the temple administrators are handling an influx, hopefully, of happy new members. And yes, some young lovers are thinking about the fact that they're going to get a second chance when Yom Kippur comes if things didn't exactly work out on Tu Ba'av. Now, the really lucky young Jewish people in the world are those in Mumbai, in India. Because in Mumbai, the ceremony of Tashlich, which is connected with Rosh Hashanah, is also a time for very serious matchmaking. So in Mumbai, they have Tuba'av, Tashlich, and Yom Kippur for love. A trifecta. Not bad. While mentioning India, where we, thank goodness, have some very special friends who study Torah with us each Shabbat. We also have other friends in Australia, Israel, the UK, France, Canada, and the United States. We now welcome students from Kenya and Uganda. Our Torah conversations really are gaining a seriously, truly international reach. Our Sedra, Vet Hanan, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23 and following. Moses pleads again, and I must assure you, not successfully for a chance to cross the Jordan enter, and to enter into the land of promise. But Moses, that's not going to happen. Moses is going to have to leave his world, just as we all must, with his life's work unfinished. God's decision is final, though Moses hasn't finished asking. Moses then describes in magnificent detail the occasion of the giving of Torah at Mount Sinai. And then, after he's done that, in our Sedra, the Ten Commandments are listed again, slightly different from their first location, which is where in the Torah? Right, Exodus chapter 20. You got it. And then, just to make certain that this particular sedra will never be ignored, and it will not ever be, we find in Deuteronomy 6.4 both the Shema and the Vyahavta. To top it off, there is language found here that enters verbatim into the Haggadah, the Passover prayer book. As Moses recounts how once we were slaves in Egypt, but God brought us forth with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, Biyad Chazakah, I'd like to share with you now a very powerful Hebrew word, zrizut. Zrizut has a number of somewhat similar meanings in English. You could say agility, nimbleness, quickness, liveliness. In Musa literature, a literature devoted to the study of the noblest of Jewish virtues 
and values. Zerizut is identified with zeal. When Abraham was told to take his son Isaac and to bind him to an altar, Abraham is described as acting with zrizut. Oh, and when those three visitors came to Abraham's tent, Abram, then Abram's tent, and, and wanted to talk to him about Sodom and Gomorrah, Abram and Sarah made sure that they had proper food to eat. Moses, Abraham acted with zrizut in offering hospitality to his divine guests. Now, sometimes when I was walking the streets of Jerusalem, I would see caftan-clad ultra-Orthodox Jews racing down the sidewalks. I didn't understand what was going on. I watched with curiosity, but quite frankly, their actions were beyond me. So I explored, and this is what I learned. These men, and they were, they were always men, were going to study. They had left their homes, but they weren't yet in the study house. The spaces between their homes and the study houses were empty spaces, spaces devoid of sacred content. So they filled those spaces with zrizut, with the urgency of rapid activity that would bring them closer to the time when they could be seated with their sacred text. They were running to study Torah, and the act of running was holy. Rabbi Shlomo Riskin finds Zerizut in our Sedra. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit in our house, and you walk by the way when you lie down, when you rise up. But wait a minute. There's no running here through the streets of Jerusalem. So, so where's the Zerizut? It's there. It really is. To the rabbis, nothing is more important than the study of Torah. Not Torah just in its narrow sense, the five books of Moses. Nothing is more important than the study of our sacred literature in all of its forms. Torah, yes, of course, the Torah, but extending as well through Mishnah and Talmud and Midrash and from my perspective, including the works of Rashi and Ibn Ezra and Maimonides, and I dare say also the writings of Spinoza and Heschel and Buber and Rosenzweig and Levinas. The rabbis profoundly and literally believe that all of creation exists only because of the study of Torah in its broadest sense. We are a triple crowned people. The crown of kahuna, of priesthood, the crown of malchut, of sovereignty, and the crown of Torah, the learning of Torah. Now, very few of us are koanim, and Sovereignty is a privilege exercised by our people only in the land and the state of Israel. But the crown of Torah, that is a crown that each and every Jew, men, women, and children can and must wear. And even the term children is understood here broadly so as to include all of those whom we would teach. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, your children biologically, all those who study with you with zrizut. Think about the word diligently, vishinantam levanecha. Not just vilimadetemotam, not just teach them from the root lomed. We must do more than open the world of an expanded Torah to our children, but we must do so with zrizut. Hear Riskin's own words. Quote, Torah is the historical gene which unites the generations, the eternal subject matter that guarantees meaningful dialogue between parents and children and grandparents and grandchildren, close quote. Thus, my friends, we learn so that we can teach. We teach so that we can transmit, and we transmit so that our lives can have meaning. And our lives will have meaning only when we contribute to the sustainability of creation itself. Isn't that beautiful? 
Vishinantam is therefore a powerful moral force, force and an overriding practical imperative. Study with Zrizut. Teach with Zrizut. And become partners with God in the work of creation with Zrizut. Okay. That's it for this week. Have a love filled weekend and see if over the course of time you can add zirizut to your moral virtues and speaking of moral virtues please hit share so that others might join this conversation shabbat shalom have a great and beautiful weekend